So you've no doubt heard about how the ancient Greeks, or more specifically the Athenians, were the ones who invented democracy, or people power. But was the ancient Athenian democracy really all that democratic? To find out, we'll have to examine a few historical and political elements of classical Athens and its surrounding suburbs. Strap out in your seatbelts, kids, because it's gonna get a little bumpy. First of all, it's important to understand that ancient Greece wasn't considered a country like we know it is today. Recall that after the collapse of the Mycenaean world, remember that place? During the Bronze Ages, the region of Greece became heavily depopulated during what was known as the Greek Dark Ages. It wasn't until the advent of the Iron Age in the late 9th and 8th centuries BCE that things started picking up again and the population began to increase. By the Archaic Age, around 750 BCE, there began to emerge on the Greek mainland a new form of social and political organization known as the polis, or city-state. That's where we get our words like police, policy, and politics from. The polis was an independent community of people inhabiting a particular territory that included both urban and rural zones. For example, the polis of Athens was composed of the city of Athens and its surrounding area known as Attica. Each polis had its own form of government, laws, and customs. It was also at around this time that Greece's increase in population necessitated an expansion of arable land. With the different polis requiring more and more land to cultivate and feed its growing population, many city-states decided to begin a process of colonization. Sending out groups of colonists from its main polis, or metropolis, the emigrating Greeks began to settle all over the Mediterranean, including regions in Sicily, southern Italy, and Asia Minor. These colonies in Asia Minor would later play an important role in the coming wars. Some Greeks even settled the lands as far as Egypt, Gaul, like ancient Marseille, and Spain. With an increase in population also came an increase in the number of non-elite, non-aristocratic men, demanding equal treatment under the law. These men, who formed part of the polis, would naturally be called upon to fight for and defend their city-state. As warfare evolved, the Greeks moved gradually from the single hero-to-hero -hero combat of Homeric times to a more organized form of fighting known as hoplite warfare. This new type of warfare consisted of fighting done in a large formation of infantrymen, known as hoplites, that fought as a unit known as a phalanx. As you can imagine, with the majority of the fighting being done by large units of men, the small groups of aristocrats who held a monopoly over the defense of their community started being outnumbered by the infantrymen, who were for the most part regular Joes coming to the defense of their polis. The emergence of this hoplite warfare may have contributed to a social mutation whereby the regular citizens felt that because they contributed equally to the defense of their community, they deserved equal treatment under the law. This hoplite revolution thus contributed to the development of the concept of citizenship. So what did being an ancient Athenian citizen mean during the Archaic Age? Well, for starters, not everyone could be a citizen. Women, children, and slaves were not eligible, since citizenship was extended only to freeborn Athenian males of the community. Although women were considered part of the legal, social, and religious community of Athens, they could only participate in civic life under the representation of a male guardian, known as a kurios. Even non-Athenian males who had immigrated to and lived in Athens were not eligible to take part unless under the guardianship of a kurios. These immigrants were called metics and were granted limited legal rights to live and conduct business in the city. So, in order to qualify as an Athenian citizen, you not only had to be a male, but also had to have a father who was a citizen. And of course, you had to have served your time in the military. Being a citizen thus gave you the right to access the courts to resolve disputes, participate in the religious and cultural life of the polis, and participate in politics. At first, Athens, like many other polis at the time, functioned under a monarchy. Legend says that Theseus, yes, that Theseus of mythological fame, 
came along and instituted a proto-democracy by sharing his royal powers while remaining king of Athens. Later on, the ruler Acastus was said to have been the last of the legendary kings of Athens. He swapped his royalty in return for life rule as Archon. Arch what, you ask? Archon. That was the title given to one of the nine leaders who were elected annually to lead the city. While at first the Archonships were for life, in 682 BCE, Athens had cut this magistracy to 10 years, and then finally settled upon a term of one year. The Archons were the leading magistrates, or rulers, of the city. In order to be eligible to be elected Archon, they not only had to have wealth, but had to belong to one of the 60 aristocratic families known as the Eupatridae. Being elected Archon thus allowed you to wield political and judicial power within the city. There were nine Archons elected every year. One leading Archon, known as the Basileus, one Archon in charge of the army, known as the Polymarch, that's an important one, six lawmaker Archons, known as Thesmothetae, and one Archon after whom the year was named. I'm sure he had other responsibilities as well. What's more, once you retired as an Archon, you were eligible to join the Council of Areopagus a council whose main job it was to interpret the constitution and its laws. Made up of ex-archons who got to serve for life, the Council of Areopagus was the primary judicial, religious, and political power of Athens, and supervised everyone, including the magistrates. But wait, what about those hard-working hoplites who put their lives on the line for the polis? Well, if they weren't wealthy and from the Eupatridae, they weren't eligible to become archons. On the bright side, they got to be part of the proto-democratic process because they were part of an assembly of all the citizens known as the Ecclesia. Composed of all the male citizens of Athens, there were up to 30,000 of them who got to participate in the political life of this emerging city-state. With the emergence of a formal governing body for the polis, there needs to be a set of laws. And so in 622 BCE, the Athenians appointed a man named Draco. Not Draco Malfoy of Harry Potter fame, but funnily enough, that's why the name suits Malfoy's character. The Athenians asked him to create a law code to establish stability and equity. Draco was a bit extreme, and his laws were considered too harsh, even causing an economic crisis, pitting the rich against the poor. For instance, citizens who could not afford to repay a debt were often sold into slaveries, and their families right along with them. You might consider Draco's law and punishments quite harsh. Draconian, in fact. And you'd be right. The Athenians also thought this was a bit much. And so, in 594 BCE, they elected an archon named Solon and asked him to reform the system. For starters, Solon forbade the selling of citizens into slavery. Next, he divided the citizen body into four census classes based on wealth, or medimnoi. At the top of the census class were the Pentacosio Medimnoi, a fancy term to refer to the citizens who held over 500 Medimnoi in income. Next came the Hippes, or Knights, followed by the Zaugites, and finally the Thetes. More importantly, Solon scheduled regular meetings of the Ecclesia, thus promoting the Assembly's legislative role. Solon also created a council within the Ecclesia, and he called it the Boule. The Boule consisted of 400 members of the Ecclesia who were drawn by lot from the two highest census classes and were in charge of preparing legislation and items, discussion for the Ecclesia. Finally, to ensure that all citizens had equal recourse before the law, it is commonly believed that he also founded the Eliaia, or People's Court of Law. Composed of 6,000 citizens over 30 years old, on any given day, there could be several juries composed of up to 500 citizens each, serving in various courts. In the end, Solon knew that, as with any reform, his proposals would meet with some opposition, and so he made the Athenians swear that after they adopted his policy, they would not alter it for at least 10 years. These reforms seemed to work, and Athenian democracy was well on its way to being born. Unfortunately, in 560 BCE, Athenian democracy hit a snag. 
It was in this year that the polemarch and war hero Pisistratus seized control of the Acropolis, Athens' political and spiritual center, and began a rule of tyranny. Nowadays, the word tyrant has a negative connotation, but back in classical times, a tyrant was simply someone who had seized power by unconstitutional means. The tyrant Pisistratus had done just that and put a pause on the evolving democracy. We don't have time to get into all the details of his reign, but one fun fact is that he became tyrant of Athens not once, not twice, but thrice. Talk about perseverance. Pisistratus ended up ruling Athens for over 30 years, and his sons Hipparchus and Hippias succeeded him as tyrants too. Eventually, the Athenians took back their polis, and under the leadership of two men named Cleisthenes and Isagoras, they drove out the tyrants. After the Pisistratids were expelled, these two men had a bit of a falling out, and Cleisthenes was expelled. But he eventually returned and set to work restoring and reforming the polis's democracy. First of all, Cleisthenes decided to try and tackle this problem of regional supremacy. Athens and its suburbs of Attica, you see, had been divided into three main regions. The coastal region, the plain region, and the town region. Each region was subdivided into ten sections, known as tritiates. As you can imagine, if one particular region and its tritiates were to have more political power, the decisions they made would most likely benefit them more than the other regions. What Cleisthenes did to address this issue was to create an entirely new way of dividing the citizens. He decided to create tribes. Each tribe would be composed of citizens who came from different parts of Attica. To put it simply, one tritiates from the coastal region, plus one tritiates from the plain region, plus one tritiates from the town region, equals one tribe. There were a total of ten tribes now, each composed of three tritiates from different regions. This eliminated the dominance of any one regional group when the tribes had to make a decision. And, remembering that citizenship and the military were closely tied together, each tribe had a general in command of the army, and this general was known as the strategos. Since there were ten tribes, there were ten strategoi in charge of the army. This is where we get our word strategy from. Cleisthenes also reformed the structure of the boule, or council. If you remember, during the time of Solon, the boule was composed of 400 members. To make things even more democratic now, Cleisthenes decreed that each tribe got to select, by lot, 50 members from their tribe to serve on the boule. With 10 tribes, that made the boule a council of 500 members. This new boule also had a rotating structure. Each tribe took turns to head the boule for one month. This one-month term in charge of the boule was known as a prytany. And because there were ten months in the Athenian calendar, each tribe had a turn. After a year, fifty new members were elected to serve on the boule, and the process began all over again. This new and approved boule had supreme authority over civil administration under the supervision of the archons, and looked after the finances, judicial, and foreign policy of Athens. Yes, my friends, democracy was well on its way. The boule was ruled by the people, with each tribe taking a turn in command during its prytany. The ecclesia was full of 30,000 citizens, uh, would vote on legislation and decisions set forth by the boule, and all under the watchful guidance of the archons and council of Areopagus. Cleisthenes' reforms were taking hold. To make democracy even more direct, Cleisthenes had one more trick up his sleeve. According to Aristotle, Cleisthenes also established an interesting procedure known as the Law of Ostracism. Its purpose was to prevent any one person from gaining too much political power and probably seizing it, like the tyrants did. Once a year, during the Sixth Brittany, the Ecclesia voted on whether or not to hold an ostracism. If the decision was yes, a secret ballot would be held whereby citizens would inscribe the name of a person they wished to ostracize onto a pot shard known as an ostracon. After the votes were counted, the citizen who gained the greatest number of votes, over 6,000, was sent into exile along with his family for 10 years. He was not stripped of his citizenship 
and still got to retain his wealth and possessions, but his exile was supposedly to prevent him from gaining too much power. Oftentimes, these ostracisms were used to keep politicians and their policies in check. Yes, in the eyes of the Athenian citizens, all of these reforms in this complex system were not just democracy. This was isonomia, or equality before the law. Not only did the, the citizens consider their form of government a stand in opposition to tyranny, they considered their polis, with its isonomia, as one in which all those who took part in public life did so as equals. Athens, my friends, was a democracy.